Welcome to the Business Podcast, where we interview professionals across all industries. And welcome back. Today we have Nathan Lewis, a published author of four books on economics, now set to release an upcoming fifth book called Inflation, co authored with Stephen Forbes and set for release in 2022. Nathan, it's a pleasure to have you with us today. How are you doing? Hello, it's great to be here. Wonderful. Nathan, kick us off. Tell us a bit about yourself and share something that most people might not know about you. Okay. Well, my main uh, role in our affairs has been to uh, write books about economics, uh, primarily monetary economics. I, I come from this with the, uh, you might call it the supply side group, which has included people like uh, Art Laffer, or Larry Kudlow, or David Malpass. And um and like those those other people, um, I've and Steve Forbes and Jack Kemp uh, tend to have be ha, they've tend to had in, have involvement in Wall Street, and as a result, they've tended not to write very many books. Um, Laffer's written a few, but that's generally been the case. And um, so it's been a very small and insular circle. And sort of when I when I got into it, I discovered that there was a lot that was known by a very small number of people. And because they never wrote anything down, no one ever, it became it just stayed as a very small circle and it was kind of in danger of going extinct altogether. Um, and so I set about essentially um, writing the other half of the, of the supply side revolution, the supply side agenda, if you will, uh, which is basically monetary. Uh, it's kind of known for its low tax, enthusiasm during the 80s and, and so forth, flat tax and that sort of thing. Um, and so I had, and so I said about doing that and basically spent about 20 years at it, I wrote uh, the uh, gold, what I call the gold standard trilogy, three books about the gold standard, um, which I think eclipses anything that has been done in the last 200 years, or I wouldn't have wasted my time writing it. So that has uh, been kind of my signature item, but it kind of goes be uh, a a ways beyond that to kind of expand the supply side approach, if you will, to hopefully to write these things down and to, and to get a, a broader, not just audience exactly, but more people who are have sort of an expert level of understanding of these things. And, um, and along the way, I've been involved in various forms of, of asset management. And uh, although I have, to, I have to say somewhat on the periphery because I've always felt like writing books has and you know this intellectual stuff has been my primary purpose. And one thing about Wall Street is it's very involving, and pretty soon you don't have time for anything else. So I've often felt that if I were to get more involved there, then all these books would never get written and and so forth. So I've I've remained somewhat on the periphery on that side. But I have I have how long is it now? Twenty years of some kind of had a hand in the game and in. in sort of macro themed asset management um, on the advisory side for hedge funds and mutual funds. I've run uh, funds myself. I'm running some money now for a very small circle. And uh, I've had pretty good performance over the years. Uh, but I think I would probably be known most for my, my uh, books and intellectual work. Well, thank you for that context, and and certainly thought leadership uh, stands the test of time, as opposed to word of mouth. Some might argue, and yeah, uh, um, kind of one thing that's been interesting about it is that unlike the other more academically inclined economists, uh, when you are involved in Wall Street on kind of a professional level, professional grade level and there's real money being won and lost and so forth. Uh, it just immerses you in the real world up to your neck, right? <laughs> you just have an understanding of what's really going on in the world, which someone who just spends all their time at, you know, in some office at Yale uh, doesn't really have any experience with. And you see that in their work. So that's, that's kind of one of the things that I think the supply side circle in general has brought that has been important. And, and I'm a representative of that, I guess you could say. Totally, especially since you've been actively managing funds throughout your career and still doing it, as you just mentioned. Maybe you can talk about 
your early days when you got your career start? What were your motivations for starting with the initial companies you did? And kind of walk us through, kind of walk us through that path of what you did then up until what you're doing now. Well, I've kind of felt like I have a destiny to do this stuff. That's why I do it. It's otherwise I wouldn't spend so much time and effort at it. Uh, I kind of felt like I had a destiny to do these things. And, you know, if someone else doesn't feel that personal need, then they probably shouldn't get involved. Um, but it came around somewhat later than, you know, Mozart who's playing violin at age three. Uh, and basically it was already in my mid twenties when I was in, in living in Tokyo and basically went there after college and studied Japanese and ended up working in um, financial media, Dow Jones. So more on, you know, Wall Street Journal. I wasn't for the Wall Street Journal, but that style of financial news. And uh, that was really my first introduction to economics and investing in business. A meaningful introduction. And that ha just happened to be the time when there was this tremendous meltdown in Asia, the Asia crisis, 1997, 1998. And it was this fantastic opportunity to kind of watch that happen in real time because as a news guy, you're supposed to be you know, up on current events. And as you're know, kind of a newbie, uh, both to news and, and economics, it became apparent to me early on that the people who are supposed to know what's going on did not. <laughs> you know, I didn't know anything about it, but I could tell they didn't either. And of course, that's why the crisis was happening <laughs> and why what they did, you know, try to fix it didn't work. And that was when I started to, to study things um, in depth. And I had a, I had a, a fantastic, so it was, it was kind of a hobby in a sense, um, on, complimentary with, but not necessary for my uh, journalistic stuff. Um, and I had this tremendous ramp up of, of studying or ability or what do you want, want to call it. And in the space of, in the space of about two years, 24 months, I went from a dead start to being to starting to write my first book. And if you've read my first book, it's you know it's fairly sophisticated actually. <laughs> I don't know any example in that of anyone ever heard of or known that can has you know like gone from zero to sort of world class level in 24 months. <laughs> so that's kind of um, and you know it's because I'm kind of supposed to do this stuff. Uh, but kind of one aspect of that was I never studied any economics in college. I was sort of interested in it. And then I kind of signed up for a class and quit the class because of, and looking back now, it makes sense because if I had kind of done the academic stuff, then I'd be as bad as all the other academic economists. <laughs> and, uh, you know, even lay people can tell that they're a bunch of klutzes. Um, so that's a little bit about the early days. And then um, I learned a, a lot of it from a guy who was involved uh, in the 70s and 80s with the, you know, the Reagan revolution and Laffer and Art Laffer and Robert Mundell and early tax cuts of the 80s and so forth. And he had been spending the 90s basically uh, doing Wall Street advisory. And this is before the internet, right? Uh, so uh, for that, in, in those days, a, a Wall Street institutional newsletter is, you, I mean, you literally printed it on a laser printer and you put it in the mail <laughs> with a stamp. <laughs> And uh, we hadn't quite advanced to email at, at that point. Um, and then 1995, as, as the internet got going, he started to put his stuff, uh, uh, you know, make it available for the, first, for the first time. Now, I remember 97 is when I got started. So I, you know, I was kind of there at this very early stage when you didn't need a printing press to make yourself known or a radio station or something like that. And... Um, as a result of that, I started, ended up working for him in, with his you know, Wall Street and institutional clients beginning in 2000, and while I was still working on my book, my first book, um, in we evenings and weekends. Well, I spent, um, I started working part-time in 2000 for him, and then uh, while I was writing my book full-time, spent about six months at that, but it wasn't finished, and then I finished it through 2004, I guess, evenings and weekends, which was really tough. Um, so that was my start in uh, on the on the business side, you know, Wall Street institutional macro clients. Most, for the most part, you know, was hedge funds were much smaller in those days, so it was mostly mutual funds. Um, they didn't really have ETFs. Uh, 
and got going with that. And uh, that eventually led to, I started, I went to work as a co-manager of a macro hedge fund in New York, 2005. And um, kind of went on from there. Uh, my first book was published in 2007. So that was, those were the early days. And uh, my, and my own, my own website uh, went online. It's at New World Economics in 2005. And now I've been working on that for 17 years. <laughs> So, and, and once again, it can, ca carries on the tradition of bringing um, just you know, economic discussion of economic topics in the supply side approach to the public where they would never, otherwise it would never be available. I don't really know of any other blogs like it. So, so hopefully it's, it's been interesting and it has its fans. So given what you just shared, it's a very compelling story around noticing that people in your profession were not very well versed in the topics. You got motivated to delve into it a bit more deeply. And as your track record shows, the people who endorse you are arguably the movers and shakers in the economic world. And so it's quite telling about perhaps the benefits that you had in not being exposed to the traditional economic curriculum at, of your time. And I'm curious what your thoughts are around that, if you can dive into that a bit more. Yeah. Um, so one of my things I wanted to set out to do is to make it possible for other people to learn what I learned. And I assembled it from bits and pieces you know, there was a comment here and a paragraph there and something in a book over there. And, and I figured, you know, no one's ever going to be able to put all this together, like, in you know, a puzzle like I did. So I kind of put the puzzle together for them so they could see the big picture. <laughs> um, was kind of how it was in the first decade or so. Um, and over time, I've realized, uh, you know, just the nature of uh, academia is, as we all know, it's, it's, um, for one thing, there's people are just kind of divorced from the real world. The real world success and failure of their ideas in the real world just doesn't really impinge on them. It's, you know, success and failure in being popular at academic conferences of other people who are equally clueless, right? <laughs> basically what it amounts to. And, and of course, you know, all of academic training is basically just regurgitating what is politically acceptable in your whatever department you happen to be in and, and then currying favor with people who give you a job and and uh, you know academic journals and all this stuff and um the the people with talent who are in that system have their talent um suppressed and uh but of course what happens to most people is they never develop any talent to begin with and they just become you know rubber stampers <laughs> for the most part um i don't i you know i can't think of one economist not one that I think is any good today. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's kind of a harsh, that's kind of a harsh uh, estimate, but uh, sometimes I'm honest, put it that way. <laughs> Maybe you can talk about the event or series of events that motivated that. Yeah, so um, I got to know Steve Forbes about 10 years ago when he uh, read and reviewed my first book. And um been a very productive collaboration over that time and he's kind of he's played a part in in we we would often go and have dinner together and we discuss something i thought you know that's pretty interesting i should probably write that down <laughs> and got three more books out of it um and uh he's been he's been pretty interesting he's, he's not only an interesting public figure but also one of the most knowledgeable people in, on economic topics that i've ever seen um, knowing a lot about the, the nitty gritty of these things and having exposed to it for 20 or 30 years. And he's always like, you know, I would, I would mention something. I mentioned the economic policy in France in 1934. And he said, but you know, there was this thing too. <laughs> Didn't really think you knew about France in 1934, but <laughs> wow. <laughs> anyway. And so we, and so we saw, we, we kind of felt like something was going on at the, at the present time pleasant era and uh, as covid hit and as central banks of the world reacted by vomiting money all over the landscape and some of that was actually justified i think but uh it seems like 
just in the last two years, we ha have accelerated the process of potentially um, just getting into a political situation. Uh, it's a political situation, not really an economic one, where it just becoming politically expedient to fund the government by printing money. And as we know, this is always a lot of fun at the beginning because it seems like you get, you know, it's free money, <laughs> inflation, uh, political heroin, basically. Um, and then it, it always ends badly. And now we're kind of, so we wanted to kind of get that out because we kind of, we, we foresaw that we we're going to have the incipient inflation, which we're sort of experiencing now. And then in the longer term, let's say 10 year, 10 year horizon, we wanted to either prevent things from just completely getting out of hand, or if, you know, there's nothing we could do and things just do get out of hand. We wanted to make a blueprint of what you do next, because people often don't talk about that. You know, okay, you, you, you had a disaster, and then what do you do? Because that could be the difference between the United States having another century of success, as it did after the Civil War, or just kind of you know, degenerating into endless chronic difficulties like Argentina after World War I. Um, so we wanted to get out there with that uh, at this time with a book about inflation. What is your process when it comes to getting historical context in your approach to your writing and how you envelop that into the story that you're telling? Well, one of the thing, interesting things I've discovered is over time, because there, as, as you look into these things, there's, there's two things you figure out. You figure out what, if you look into historical issues, which I have over a period of years, what was going on and why can't other people figure out what was going on? Because you investigate what was going on, on a little bit and you sort of get a grip of it. And then you re read some economist version of things and you realize it's completely out to lunch. You know, like there's just no reference to the most important events of the time. And um, it's interesting you, you bring up historicity because uh, economics became very abstract in the late 19th century. It became based, the, the model was physics and engineering, um, you know, basically building steam engines or internal combustion engines or something like that, right? You know, it's like compression ratios and I don't know, you know, air fuel mixtures and, and things like that, uh, which have no historical context, right? It's the, the equations or the relationships that determine the proper building of a steam engine don't change from 1890 to 1990. Although I, I guess the technology does. Um, but in economics, uh, you have history <laughs> and, um, and, and so what, one, of the, one of the strangest things is, is that, again, we have, we've had basically a hundred years where we've done, and continuing to the present, where we've done economics, where academics have kind of done this, as if history didn't exist. As, um, tried, I, I've, I've read accounts of the, of, um, the recession of 1921, the recession in the United States of 1921. And I was reading an account of it by someone writing in 1932. And he lived through the recession. He was there. He voted for Warren Harding in the 1920 election. Um, but he, but the, uh, the account makes no mention of World War I. <laughs> and it's like, you know, this is bonkers, right? But it was just the characteristic of the time and continuing to today. So, so one of the things that we did, uh, or in a sense I did, is to bring this back, bring back history <laughs> and put it into economics. Um, another, another aspect of, of that is, is policy that is not easily reduced to numbers. Uh, for example, regulation, business regulation can have a gigantic effect on economies, you know, rent controls or price controls or any kind of regulation. But you can't really quantify it, right? You can't just say we have, you know, 87 units of regulation in the United States in 1987. Right? <laughs> 
so to to trace to trace the relationships of regulation to economics um, requires, in a sense, some kind of history. Uh, there, there's always economists who who focus on you know that one little corner, right? They just say, oh, this is the effects of airline reg regulation on airlines, but you don't get it in the broader um, historical context. Um, very obvious one, the Spoot Hawley tariff of 1930, um, gigantic tariff in, uh, increase in the United States was met with retaliatory tariffs all around the world. Every, the whole world got into a big trade war. Um, often gets no mention um, in economic accounts of the Great Depression. <laughs> just doesn't fit, right? It's history, it's words, and they, they want to do numbers and, you know, words and numbers, just the oil and water. So they just got admitted. Um, this is kind of, I mean, it's, 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 it's so simple really. Uh, but for some reason, economists haven't done it for a hundred years. I appreciate the way you expressed uh, that viewpoint. And I'm curious, and this is probably a question that you'll have multiple answers for. Mm -hmm. uh, what other viewpoints you have that you'd characterize or others might characterize as atypical in comparison to some of the more popular economic uh, schools of thought of today or recent past? Good, yeah. So try, try to express... The, you know, the, the character of what I call the supply side school, because it's not certainly not just me. Um, I stole a ton of it. And that's, that's fine. Um, my fourth book was called The Magic Formula. It came out in 2019. And it really is kind of an introduct introduction to, you know, Reagan style, Jack Kemp style, Steve Forbes style, uh, economics and public policy for the first time reader. Um, the ideas in it will be familiar to anyone who's read the op-ed page of the Wall Street Journal over the last 30 years. But certainly to my knowledge, there's never been a book that put it together in one place where someone who wasn't familiar with it could pick it up. Um, and also it's updated somewhat to 2019 because you can't really take, you know, well, they, well, this guy did a paper in 1976 and, you know, it's like, yeah, okay. Uh, <laughs> we got to update these things. And the other thing is I want to make it simple because you can talk about economics forever, but we're really dealing with statesmen here, right? Prime ministers and treasury secretaries and people who are busy and also have real life problems to deal with. Um, and we boiled it down to two things, and that was low taxes and stable money. Um, we have capitalist systems, and even if you're have a lot, have a big government, Maybe if you're France or you're Belgium and you have high taxes and that kind of thing, it's still a capitalistic system. We don't have the Soviet, you know, command economy. And if the capitalistic system doesn't work well, then you are going to have problems. And if you have uh, a tax system, which impairs the capitalistic system, um, there's just going to be chronic problems. Right. And, um, and, We've also determined, I think it's the supply side view, and I think it is right, uh, that the most important thing is the taxes and, you know, and regulation too. But uh, typically what we find is the, is something, is the regulation side that is, can be very harmful, like price controls or something like that. As soon as you fix the tax and monetary issues, it becomes politically easy just to, that just, just, just goes out the window instantly, you know, and, and, and state-owned companies get privatized and and that stuff tends to resolve itself as a consequence of getting the tax policy and monetary policy right uh, and then the monetary policy is stable money so uh the supply side stance the jack the uh jack kemp steve forbes uh ronald reagan stance has always been well the united states used the gold standard system for nearly 200 years from its founding until 1971 uh and the principle was the money stayed stable in value. It was the money was linked to gold and didn't change. Um, and it worked pretty well. Our, uh, the United States became the wealthiest country in the history of the world. Uh, the final decade of the gold standard era, 1960s, is still today. Some people think that, yeah, you know, technology's changed, but 
never since then has the, the middle class and the middle middle class, you know, not the Yale graduates, but the auto mechanics and the construction workers and the factory workers, never have they had it as good as they did then. Um, and so we've had now uh, 50 years of, of, I call it the PhD standard, a um, bunch of academics arguing with each other about economic statistics. And by our estimate, the value of the dollar today is about one fiftieth of what it was worth in the 1960s. So we, you know, we, it's two cent dollar. That's how far the currency has fallen over that time. So that's not stable money. And and there's a consequence to that. And it's it's not real hard to figure out what they are. Um, you can't devalue yourself to prosperity. And although overt devaluation uh, is unpopular, it's you know you can't depreciate yourself to prosperity when currencies have a ten chronic tendency to decline, uh, um, chronic meaning not continuous, but intermittent as we just are experiencing now, you're just not gonna get ahead, right? Uh, when your currency is declining, everyone gets poorer and you can't get richer by making people poorer. <laughs> it's really that simple. So low taxes, stable money. And uh, we're going in the wrong direction on both of those fronts now. So you can see how popular those ideas are. Appreciate the way you express that. Um, when you think about the the elements and what's going on to presently, mm -hmm. what what are the elements that or the ideas that excite you most about the future? Um, one of the things I like is that I kind of follow the fourth turning framework to uh, William Strauss, Neil Howe book fourth training a lot of people have read these days and they kind of have this historical theory where there's about an 80 year cycle and at the beginning of the cycle things are kind of fresh and new and they, and they sort of mature and then they sort of become decrepit and old and decay and collapse at the end of the cycle and we're sort of at the i would say the end of that cycle now almost exactly as they predicted 25 years ago and that is all these kind of post post world war ii institutions sort of struggling against their inherent uh, and you know inherent problems or, or becoming just kind of old, like the entitlement programs, like the sort of mid 20th century big government high tax system, like the uh, you know the floating fiat currency, central bank money, funny money stuff. all these all these things are kind of coming to their natural conclusion. And um, they had looked at, into these kind of cycles many times in history and they said, yeah, you know, it pretty much just works out the way you think it will, which for us would be that, you know, the United States and around the world will eventually have some sort of like, you know, sovereign debt uh, deficit currency issue. And it would be, it would just kind of, you know, reach an end stage. Mm -hmm. um, and the nice thing about that is, and, I, and everyone's kind of like, ah, oh, you know, is my pension fund going to be worth anything? Whatever they kind of have this disaster mentality, and uh, which is justified, I think. But I like I like to look go one step further. It's like okay, yeah, probably can't do anything about it. Probably can't really fix it. Uh, but what happens afterwards? And afterwards, if you look at this, uh, what other countries have done, you have this wonderful time when all of the stuff that was impossible to fix before, you know, you couldn't reform social security, you couldn't reform Medicare for decades or whatever, the healthcare system in general, which is a big mess. And then just because it kind of fell over and died of its own accord, you know, the house burned down by itself, you have to make something new. And then all these ideas, which had been just kind of on the shelf, get put into play for better or for worse, right? Um, Russia, after in in out of the shock of World War One, uh, adopted state communism. It didn't work out so well, but you can see you know, the the ideas of the time were manifested in, in real policy. And so, for me, I say you know things might get real bad, but we want to be there with a fully developed plan for framework for where we would like to see the United States go in the future. Uh, for example, lower taxes, more stable money. Um, 
because if we can get the, if we can set that framework at the beginning, we might enjoy uh, you know 80, another 80 years of success as a result of that, um, as the U.S. did after Civil War, for example, or after World War II. Um, so I see I see that I see that as a good thing, and already and. When that happens, you're not going to have, you know, you say, oh, all we've done around is sit around the table and debate for 10 years. You know, we made a flat tax proposal, but of course, it never passed Congress. Well, over 30, 30 countries did pass it, and they were in a political position to do so because it was the collapse of the Soviet Union. <laughs> and they said, well, what's the best ideas around? And they grabbed Steve Forbes' flat tax plan and they implemented it in, you know, Bulgaria. <laughs> so we're going to have that Bulgaria moment, I think. Uh, where we can actually do this stuff. Um, and there's also a lot of other things. Another thing I've been very involved in since about 2007 is um, basically the replacement of the automobile suburb model of urban development. And it's kind of driving everyone crazy. And, and we had to uh, create a new model we couldn't just come, you can't just complain about it. You have to, you need an alternative. And we kind of created a new model in people's minds. And that is now being rolled out uh, aggressively around the world. And I think that's absolutely going to be part of our next hundred years of global development, where we're just going to take automobiles out of cities. You're going to say, you know what? Automobiles mobiles are great if you're driving across Kansas or you just want to have a joy ride on Saturday on a Saturday afternoon, personal automobiles. Um, but they're not really appropriate for dense urban areas. And we'll rebuild everything so that you can live without a car very comfortably, I think. And that's already starting to it's not, it's not happening so much in the United States, but it's happening very much in the rest of the world. What you just shared uh, brings about a couple of interesting ideas and one of them is, uh, to your point earlier, around these 80-year cycles. Mm -hmm. The idea of what's been going on globally for the past couple of years has accelerated software technology. Mm -hmm. and, and so the question is, what ideas have come about for you when it comes to how software technology is going to impact those cycles? in one way or the other. Have you had any yeah, insights uh, or, or thoughts around that? Um, I've basically, my area of interest has been completely non-technological. Um, I see the previous cycle, the 20th, it's not just 20th century, but uh, I call it the era of heroic materialism to borrow Kenneth Clark's term from 1969, where we were experimenting with technology. And in the, in, the, in the early days, it was a steam engine and it was the you know, mechanized cotton loom. And then it went on from there. And we have this technology makes life better model. Um, and for most of our lives, or the, you know, the various aspects of our lives, it's kind of stagnated, right? Commercial aviation is cheaper than it was in 1965, but it looks about the same. And our cities look about the same. They've probably gotten worse. Um, and I don't see, you know, I don't see really software adding, you know, there's, there's the, there's the, uh, you know, the, basically the China social credit system, uh, you know, these, these sy technological systems of government, um, surveillance, but I don't see them adding a whole lot to people's, uh, well-being, um, beyond perhaps where they've gone already. I see all the advantages coming from things that are not technological. Um, one of these being uh, city design, completely non-technological. <laughs> a lot of the, a lot of the uh, successful cities in the world, uh, we're talking about like, you know, 16th century <laughs> ideas here, which we can use now and, and gain gigantic advantages gigantic advantages and not just you know put a television screen on a coke can because you know who cares about that <laughs> right we, we don't you know uh, so, so putting a battery in a car right i'm much more interested in getting in setting up a city where you don't need a car 
much more interesting idea for me. Um, even something like bicycles. You know, bicycles are very big these days. Uh, you know, simple, mature technology. But now we are doing things with it, um, with the bicycle, <laughs> which I think, you know, personally has much more promise over the next 20 years than any PowerPoint deck I've seen from any wise guy with a software idea. That's my view. Well, Nathan, it's been a pleasure connecting and uh, hearing your viewpoints and perspectives and uh, look forward to hearing about uh, new works that you'll be working on, albeit uh, you have one upcoming. And so thanks for talking a bit about that. If we switch gears a bit and you had the chance to go back into any point in history, who first comes to mind? I tend to be a fan of uh, Caesar Augustus. Octavian, who was is generally regarded as the best leader in the history of the West, from Greeks to the present day, uh, took Rome in chaos and seized control of in like you know tremendous daring and ambition, and then set up the set up the framework for another two hundred years of Roman triumph, and he did it by reducing taxes and stabilizing the currency, um, among other many of his, his positive policies. Uh, just heroism on a gigantic scale. And maybe we'll have an opportunity where we'll, we can hope for someone like that in the future. Thank you so much for that. And until we speak again, maybe you can share a parting thought. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, my, my economic work can be summed up in the magic formula, loan taxes, stable money. Uh, when everything is burning down and it seems like there's a hundred problems that are more important. If you get those two things right, all the other stuff falls into place. And if you don't get those two things right, you can try to solve all the other 99 problems and it's not going to work. It's all you need to remember. Get it right or suffer the consequences. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for attending the business podcast and stay tuned for more episodes.